Hey, it's your buddy Peace and Harmony with you here today. We're focusing in on how to stand up for yourself once you have discovered, once you have decided, once you have determined that you're in an abusive relationship. Um, not just any abusive relationship, but essentially one that is abusive by nature of a character disordered individual. So someone who is narcissistic, someone who is sociopathic, someone who in essence is presenting a lot of psychopathy uh, personality characteristics in the relationship and you want to know how to stand up for yourself. Now that you're learning about this, discovering it, what do you do? How do you begin the journey? <clears throat> what are some of the steps? What can you expect? Where should your focus be? Well, number one, I would highly recommend is actually having a focus. Uh, when, when people are beginning to realize that they've suffered uh, for months, years, decades at the hands of a narcissistic or psychopathic abuser, they really are looking for a solid strategy, really how to recover that sense of self, that sense of security, that sense of safety, that sense of being, basically just being okay. And in, in essence, that is really coming to the present. Uh, one thing we find uh, regarding um, narcissistic abusers, uh, essentially uh, people who utilize and manipulate and control others for the sole purpose of having them as a source of narcissistic supply in their life, sociopathic supply in their life. And when we talk about supply, um, we're talking in essence about a role. Um, it's about a sort of function, a u utilitarian uh, effect that you uh, are to them rather than having a relationship with these people. And in essence, this is going to create, in essence, it's going to create a bond, but it's going to create a traumatic bond. So it's not a relationship where you feel like you can move in and out of the relationship and have good communication and have a lot of careless laughs together, a lot of spontaneity. Um, really, in essence, you feel like you have to constantly be on guard, hypervigilant, um, and really what um, is described as walking on eggshells. Uh, that's a kind of a common term in uh, the uh, psychology industry and arena. So walking on eggshells uh, is essentially the feeling of, you know, kind of like you have to watch your step. You have to constantly watch your P's and Q's around these people. Um, you have to, you feel like you're constantly on trial. You feel like you're constantly being persecuted by this individual person. In essence, like you're living with a member of the CEI, the FBI, the, you know, criminal investigation unit. And, you know, this is supposed to be your family member. This is supposed to be your spouse. This is supposed to be, you know, your coworker or your boss, but yet they're, they're, um, intertwining you in a cycle of narcissistic or psychopathic abuse. And the narcissistic abuse, as we're discussing supply here, in essence, it is a role. It's a utilitarian role that the narcissist abuser will incorporate into your uh, relationship, uh, inner workings, and dynamic. And remember a, a few hallmark traits of a narcissist, and that is essentially one that they operate in their daily life uh, essentially around the clock 24-7, that they have a very much inflated superior sense of themselves. So it's it's not oftentimes based on, um, you know, sort of accomplishments, although it can be, but it's just a heightened sense of self-importance, pathologically so, and it means to the uh, detriment or harm of others. In other words, for them to maintain this superior sense about themselves, an inflated ego, if you will, they um, they seek out people who will continue to reinforce this mechanism in their life. So they will continue to surround themselves with people who serve as a vehicle to letting them, you know, maintain this superiority complex, this uh, superior sense um, in, uh, in a relationship where, in essence, you know, it's very hierarchical in nature where you know, this person is um, above and this person is below, and then they kind of brainwash you or gaslighting to feel that you actually belong in this underling, underring uh, you know, uh, position. They brainwash you and gaslighting you through in a, um, narcissistic mirroring 
to you, which is feeding you messages that you're less than, inferior than, you you know you're not rising up to certain standards, um, you're not meeting their perfectionist expectations, and that you're incessantly a disappointment. Something is wrong with you, and in essence, this you know cr c combined with a lack of empathy, which means it's a very one directional, one way sort of projection of this. Uh, relationship or these messages onto the supply with which they're abusing. So combined with this lack of empathy, they're not really then receptive, open, available <laughs> to hearing your response. It's it's very much like a um, they have a closed uh, door, a closed heart. They're not open to um, entertaining your feedback, your experience with being abused. You know, they're not um, they're not open to discussing, uh, discussing, in fact, they very much um, do not, it, it's very difficult to, I, I think, um, ascertain a common language or common denominator with this abuser because they're operating on a narcissistic supply level where in essence they're constantly uh, creating their own rules, their own terms of engagement. And so, you know, people then tend to um, not have a, uh, an ability to stand up to them. Um, because, you know, they're, it's so ingrained in them uh, what their position is. And oftentimes um, people, you know, and then, the, you know, the uh, psychopathy uh, presents as well, but it's just a little bit more severe. Uh, the uh, psychopathic abuser really abuse really without conscience. So when we say without conscience, it means that they really do not have uh, a sort of moral, ethical, um, sort of... Uh, you know, break in, in, in their, in, in their emotions. They, they're not able to put on the brakes if something is immoral or not. They just, they don't care. They literally, um, will go to any lengths, extremes at which to, uh, gaslight you, brainwash you, keep you in a position of supply, whatever it is, you know, in that parasitic type of relationship where they are in essence, you know, getting some sort of psychological nutrient, um, you know, mirroring nutrient, or just having you um, as kind of a uh, punching bag, if you will, to, um, you know, abuse in a psychopathic, uh, psychopathy sort of way, which can oftentimes in, in, in also um, include a lot of sexual abuse as well, that whole, you know, violation of boundaries and breaking one down. So in essence, if you found yourself in this situation, this relationship, within your spouse, within your family, a coworker, what can you really do to stand up? You know, how can you change things? How can you change the tune of the relationship? Well, realize that in, in essence, you know, become first aware of the role that you played and that really in essence that this person, this abuser had instilled this um, role within you and it has nothing to do with reality. It has nothing to do with the real you. It has nothing to do with your uh, desires, your interests, your passion. In essence, you know, unbeknownst to you, you are ingrained and meshed um, in, you know, in this uh, abusive uh, relationship. I think, you know, in the love bombing, it's, you know, it's uh, undiscerned to the eye or to the heart or to the consciousness that you're being, you know, abused. You know, people really don't know better. Um, you know, and so this very uh, quality of not knowing better, not knowing how to stand up for yourself, not knowing that the abuse is going on, I think is one of the first, you know, um, how the love bombing occurs because it's, um, it's, it's not able to be detected. Um, you just don't know better. So for example, if, you know, if one is young and naive in love or as a child or as an unsuspecting coworker, you know, they're taking um, this abuser's uh, word as law in essence. So they're, you know, this, um, and then they're, you know, incorporated into this codependent relationship where they constantly are striving then to fulfill those supply needs of that narcissist. So they become very much into the people pleasing where people ha who have a, um, a codependent tendency or who, who like to please others or take care of others, a caregiving heart, a good heart, a sensitive. Uh, we find a lot of people who are sensitive in nature, uh, creative in nature, um, you know, have that sort of um, personality type, if you will, um, you know, very subjective, uh, supportive type people. Um, you know, they will very much stay in abusive relationships with these people for quite a long time, as well as be initially targeted. But 
they have a tendency to not really identify, you know, that this is going on. And so as they continue um, to receive these messages, um, the, um, the supply kind of gets confused, gets brainwashed, goes through a lot of cognitive dissonance, and just in essence is on, you know, a full throttle forward, and how can I better, you know, pr uh, please this person? So in essence, they end up in that process of, because, you know, uh, keeping this person happy in your environment becomes so integral to your life purpose that you, you know, you live for nothing else than keeping this person happy so you can keep peace, so you can keep, you know, uh, rage under control, so you can at least keep, you know, the rumbling at bay, you know, um, that, you know, people will then, you know, put this person so much at the focus um, in the center of, uh, of attention, the center of the, the circus ring, you know, the, the center um, at the helm, I mean, they will, you know, to the extent that they will end up giving up all of their time, energy, and focus onto this one person. So that's really what, what codependency is. It's enabling um, this person to continue to um, really sort of um, take supply uh, from you, be it support, be it acknowledgement, being, uh, you know, practical uh, house cleaning stuff for them relentlessly. Um, cooking for them, shopping for them, uh, keeping a roof over their head, whatever the parasitic uh, dynamics of the relationship are. That is really the essence of the codependent tendency where, in essence, you know, you have to, um, you know, forego all of your needs, your self-esteem to enable this person to continue that abusive dynamic. And you're then, your self-esteem, how you really um, approve of yourself, how you feel about yourself is based on this person, which is erroneous, which is not correct. You know, one's um, relationship to yourself and others, that is what a self-esteem is. Self-esteem is how you feel about yourself. And what ends up happening is it becomes intertwined. So um, in the codependent abusive relationship, how the person feels about themselves is defined by this person. So it's basically a mirroring. It's a, you know, so if you're being fed these abusive message, the wrong message, then of course, then how can you not but internalize this state of shame? I'm not good enough. I'm inherently flawed. Something is wrong with me. Um, you know, and then you're constantly living in this self-doubt. And then this in, in turn creates not only a flawed self-belief, it creates a flawed uh, feeling and emotion because your belief uh, then um, changes up your, your your beliefs about yourself. So you tend to live by then self-limiting beliefs. And then, you know, this kind of uh, perpetual fear, guilt, intimidation, and obligation to this person creates a lot of anxiety and depression, which then becomes the language of the body, which is the emotions, you know, of, of um, helplessness. Uh, the emotions of depression, you know, uh, which is, you know, not being um, in, in tune with yourself. It's living by self-doubt, self-negativity, so, you know, negative validation. You've been negatively validated, you know, and so that, you know, causes depression because you, you're not in touch with your own self-esteem. And so when people say, I feel like I've lost touch with myself, this is really what's happening. You know, you're, you're too in touch with this other person and their feedback of you to be in touch with yourself and, and your own gratitude uh, for life, your own self-approval, your own belief and faith in yourself, your self-trust. You know, these all come with, um, you know, being in healthy relationships. And of course, you know, our family of origin is to instill this belief in oneself, to be told, you can do it, you got this, go ahead, you know, I know you can do this. We're going to get up extra early. We're going to work on this cheerleading for you. We're going to work on your math for you. You know, we're going to get you to your soccer practice. You got this. You know, that sort of encouragement in the beginning is what we call healthy narcissistic mirroring. So when you're fed these messages, then as a child, young, you know, young person, young adult, you, you then internalize it. So you have an, an, an intact sense of self and what is called self-esteem. So you believe positively about yourself and you've got this with you and you take this with you in all areas of your life. So if you have been receiving these wrong messages now, you have to implant these new healthy messages from yourself, from yourself, from yourself, which then will then relate to uh, re, uh, you know, using the, the affirmations, which are going to change 
your your chemistry um, in your mind and what we call neuroplasticity, which is the ability of the mind to uh, re, re, uh, connect, um, create new neural pathways, <laughs> which are in essence, you know, the language of the of, of the mind are your thoughts and your beliefs. So that's the function of the mind, just like, you know, you have a function of your hand, which is to pick up things, <laughs> function of your eyes to see things, you know, uh, function of your heart to pump blood, you know, um, all these things. So that's the function of the mind, which is really those self-beliefs, um, uh, those thoughts about ourselves. And so as you begin then to provide yourself that healthy mirroring that you were deprived of, I am good enough. You got this. Let's go here. <laughs> You know, this is going to fly. This is going to work. You know, this instills your self-belief and then it connects you to your higher consciousness and it opens up that sort of atmosphere of safety. And um, once you experience this, and you have to practice it again and again and again. So when I talk about the necessity of working, um, you know, a daily recovery plan daily, that's because it takes practice, it takes experience, and it takes some, at least in the beginning, conscious vigilance. But then as you do it again and again, it's going to become learned and it's going to become known and it's going to become absorbed and it's going to function unconsciously for you. And then you're going to really begin to have that inner cauterization of healing. And then, you know, with that, then you're going to have um, the language of the body, which is the feelings of relaxation, of letting go, of being in the present moment and not living in the, the hurt of the past, all that, you know, negativity um, those um, erroneous messages are no longer driving your thoughts. They're no longer driving your self-belief. They're no longer driving your body. You've, you've disconnected from them because those, you know, that was just, that person was just a, a false mirror to you. And really in essence, you know, nothing more on that psychological level. Um, you know, you might've lived with this person, you know, you might've had meals with them, but you know, once you really realize that that was, you know, an, an, an erroneous flood uh, message and mirror, um, you know, uh, in, in, you know, um, uh, in impacting your life, you then realize that, you know, you are now self-dependent in providing those messages and then creating those better feelings and then being drawn by that vision in the future of, you know, of, of your own true values, your own true interests, your true passions, really what they call like getting to know yourself, your interests, what you're into and being permitted to do that because, um, oftentimes when we talk about, um, you know, abusive relationships in the past, um, you know, people will say, well, I never got a chance to know myself or, you know, be in touch with, with my own really needs because I had to live by the values of this other person. So we call that individuation where you're able to separate and then live by your own values and be able to articulate those, uh, know those, live by those, um, get around other people who can listen to those and who hold and share the same values as you. So then we call that identification, where you identify and relate to actually people who are on that wavelength, which is going to be, you know, a, a whole nother spiritual level for you. Um, and so, and realize that, you know, this is permission-based. So realize, like in the words of Eleanor Roosevelt, um, she was the, uh, the first lady of uh, Teddy Roosevelt, uh, a president in the United States. And she says, you know, no one can make you feel inferior without your consent. So when you realize the, the validity and the reality of that, that, you know, once you realize this, no one can really um, have permission to make you feel um, less than without your allowing them or agreeing to it. So stop agreeing with the abuser. Stop, um, you know, uh, you know, identifying with their, their flawed vision of you. Realize that it's a flawed version, you know, <clears throat> it's a flawed message that they're giving you. It has nothing to do with reality. It has nothing to do with you. You no longer give permission to them um, to, you know, to uh, uh, disrespect you, talk to you in such a way. So, you know, uh, you know, and realize that, you know, oftentimes self-esteem, that feeling of, you know, how you feel about yourself is also permission-based. I now give myself permission to feel gr good about myself. I now give myself permission to take charge of my life. I now, go, now give myself permission to feel complete 100% self-esteem. And I give myself permission now to be responsible and accountable and in charge of my own emotions. And I now give myself permission to live my life by my own values and not the values of an abuser. And so once you realize this <laughs> and give yourself permission to feel good about yourself 
and say, I do feel good about myself. I am a good person. I am loving and kind. And I'm now giving that to myself and to other people in life who can reciprocate and who can acknowledge and see this in me and valid validate that within me and not that of the abuser. And um, furthermore, you know, people, you know, how do you then stand up to an abuser? What's well, a simple statement? It's catching it. It's catching it. It's becoming aware. It's saying, you know what, this, this treatment is no longer going to fly with me. I'm sorry. Boom, and you're out of there. Um, this, you know, this sort of uh, behavior is not going to work for me. Uh, this, is not, um, this is not who I am. I apologize. This is not going to fly for me. This is not going to work for me. I, I can't have this in my life. I apologize. So it's just, it's just stating as a matter of fact and then letting go of that abuser. You have to make a simple statement <clears throat> from a sense of being responsible and not reacting, not reacting, just saying, you know, I'm sorry, that's not going to fly with me. <clears throat> you know, I'm that, that's where I draw the line. That's where I draw the line. That's, you know, <clears throat> you know, I, I, I'm not having this anymore. Period. End of story. You're making a declarative statement. You're standing up for yourself and you're moving on. You're no longer tolerating um, this sort of, uh, you know, erroneous. And then you'll be, really begin to hear it, catch it, and understand it. So um, please utilize those tools. Utilize the tools of the recovery journal and write out those affirmations even 20, 50, 100 times. I am magnificent. I am wonderful. I am accountable to myself. I am in control of my own life. I decide my own values. I live my own values. I live according to what is true to me and I love my truth. I embrace my truth every day. And I, I live my truth with integrity. I live my truth with wholeness. I live my truth with accountability and I'm accountable to myself. And I am important in that I create my own values on a daily basis and I live by my values on a daily basis and I am wonderful. I give myself permission to feel complete, whole, and give myself the experience to, um, I, give, I give myself permission to experience the joy, the bliss, and the wonderful feeling of happiness that comes with being in charge of my own emotions, my own values, my own outlook and perspective, and I live by my perspective every day. And I no longer give that over to the abuser who's outside of me now, um, and I'm drawing the line, and I embrace my truth, I em embrace my reality, and I love being accountable to myself, and I love being free and being my own person. Those are what I want you to, to as you continue to write, that helps to also uh, incorporate that and realize, um, get that into a muscle memory here. So, um, and also utilize the other recovery tools that we discussed here, the recovery dates, uh, the recovery gifts, so it just keeps it alive. Um, you know, and, and all incorporated in you, um, your, your visualization, your uh, vision board of, you know, keeping your mind focused on that healthy image of yourself and, you know, that mentor that keeps you um, attuned and focused. It's very important to keep that focus, work it consistently each and every day, you know, really begin to take hold and heal you really for the rest of your life. Peace and harmony with you here today. I hope these videos do help. Please share and please subscribe for more great tools, videos, discussion, and support.